Thank you, Tom. Uh, it's wonderful to be here um, despite the snow delay. Um, I'm glad to see everybody. So uh, I'm going to start out and talk about uh, Frenchman's Bay historically. Um, this is a project that when I started at the Bio Lab in 2004, I encountered a wealth of information going back to the 19th century and then into the 20th century that's exposed from the Bio Lab as well as other naturalists that I'll talk about tonight. So I'm going to give you a little perspective on the history of, of the bay, how productive it was, and then I'll transfer over to Jane for um, the more modern perspective. So uh, I was, my eye was caught in 2009 by this paper, which you can't see, was published in Fish and Fisheries. Uh, by a group based out of um, the University of New Hampshire. It was the uh, Gulf of Maine History Project, and these are history of science folks. And they were looking at um, records of um, fisheries productivity and amount of effort to catch fish all across the Gulf of Maine. And the figure here is from their paper. And what you see here is a map of Frenchman's Bay. <coughs> and the uh, uh, Low voids here are fishing areas, um, and so this represents a single year of fishery data from 1861 from a single vessel con content out of uh, Trenton. The reason these records exist is because this was an economic development exercise. Uh, starting in the 1790s and through the Civil War era, the U.S. government was paying people to catch cod. And the way they paid them was based on how many fish they landed. So the, the archives are filled with fishing records like this. And one of the best records is this decade out of Frenchman's Bay. Um, I've collaborated with the folks from UNH. And, um, and I'll show you a little bit more of that. The point here to this slide is that Frenchman's Bay was once an incredibly productive inshore ground for ground fish cod, haddock, halibut, in this slide particularly cod. So in a single year, a smallish vessel fishing the inshore grounds caught over 10,300 cod. Okay? <laughs> Let's step forward uh, to 1935. This is actually um, some pictures from a family scrapbook. And in the top left here, you see Tug Bunker uh, doing the classic uh, style of fishing called tub trawling, where you put out a single line with many hooks. Um, he's setting this with a wooden stick. You'll see this again in a, in a recent video of the work we've done. Um, this was a, a, day, a day trip. Um, that, this is a, my great uncle here as a little boy. Um, and they went out to, to look for cod. And you can see here the yield. This was fished on the Baker's Island ridges in August of 1935, 36 actually. The cod were plentiful still then, and they were quite large. Um, the other thing that I want to point out is in the bottom right corner, you can see, if you can see in the audience, um, Tud Bunker is, is gaff hooked a fairly large scape. That's a barn door scape. These are now extirpated from the Gulf of Maine. They're locally extinct. You can't find them here. Um, and there's a second one lying on the bottom of the dory. So you can see that this bay from the 1860s into the, the first half of the 20th century was quite productive relative to the fishery. What impressed me in 2004 when I joined the Bio Lab was a deep history of collection data that existed. And much of this came from a man named William Proctor, interesting character. His grandfather was one of the founders of Proctor & Gamble. Um, after a successful career as an investment banker, at age 35 he decided to retire. He didn't really need to work. He started something called the Mount Stewart Island Survey, and he mostly spent his time looking at terrestrial organisms and biodiversity, but he spent several summers working in the bay um, and doing a biological survey. This is now the Forester Cottage at MDIBL. Um, it was his research laboratory. He had a falling out with the bio lab and then moved his whole operation to his private property, which I think burned in the fire um, of 1947. But he, he collected across over 100 dredge sites and about 25 shore sites and documented the biodiversity of what was in the marine environment between 1926 and 1932. So coincident with the records you saw of those family photos I pulled out. Um, also at the same time, the bio lab had a history of collecting marine specimens. And just today, Jane and her AmeriCorps volunteer um, 
scanned in the PDF files um, 600 pages of collection records that exist from about 1926, from the founding of the BioLab on Mount Stewart Island, which was about 1921, <laughs> through to the 60s and 70s. And all those collection records are on three by five cards. And so there's this wealth of information about what diversity existed. Um, there's also very early information that's interesting from a family that's still represented on the island, Dwight Blaney, uh, lived out on Ironbound Island and was quite a good malacologist. <coughs> and his publication records from 1904 also show that there was great biodiversity on the island. For example, in, Ted, in 10 um, haddock stomachs that he dissected in 1904, he found 26 different species of mollusks. In our recent work, we are struggling to find five species in the dredge samples we're getting, just to give you some idea of the dynamism and the changes. Now remember, the changes in the bay are both being driven by man-made influences like fisheries pressures, but also changes naturally in the bay through temperature changes and so on. Maybe not man-made. So let's fast forward to 2010. Um, I was talking to collaborators of mine that I work with from Southern Maine Community College that are interested in fisheries biology. And the three of us here um, got together. This is Brian Tarbox, who's at Southern Maine Community College, uh, myself, and Roger Woodman. Roger had bought a sort of derelict schooner from the whole quarry yard of Jock Williams that had been previously built and owned here on the island and retrofitted it to fish in what we'll call the artisanal method, using the traditional methodologies. We hatched this plan that we would go out fishing um, and use traditional 1860s technology to see whether we could catch the same things that we had the records from shown on the first slide from the, the for example, that vessel of content from, from Trenton. So here are our tub trawls. And I'm going to show you a little video, if technology uh, allows, um, of, of the outcome. This exercise um, caught the interest of the public broadcasting system. And so, hopefully this will work. You be a fool's errand, but we're going to look for cod in Frenchman Bay. Cod in Frenchman Bay. There's been no cod fishing here for almost a hundred years. We'll be looking at different parts of the bay using various methods. First, a net called a Scottish seine that we lay out in a big loop, big loop, then quickly pull in. It should catch pretty much everything here. We took the net in different spots and our catch. We got uh, one small flatfish, which I think is probably a blackback flounder, a winter flounder, a winter flounder. Well, that makes sense. Young fish are what you'd expect to find in this sheltered bay, but no cod. Now we're trying a baited longline, which fishermen adopted at the end of the 19th century. You have to watch out not to catch yourself. <laughs> that was the old-fashioned way. Yeah. <laughs> Brian Tarbox, a local fisheries biologist, went down to check out our line, but all he could see was crabs eating our bait. <laughs> Even so, when we hauled in the line a couple of hours later, like all fishermen, we were optimists. Oh, oh my god! It's a goddamn codfish. <laughs> <laughs> Signs of life in Frenchman Bay. It was still a good sign, a young pollock, a kind of fish that hangs out near the bottom, like cod. In fact, the bottom of the bay looks pretty good, with healthy eelgrass beds in the sandy areas and thick forests of seaweeds on the rocky parts. fish love this kind of habitat, but here it's eerily empty, left to the crabs and lobsters, it seems. Okay, so, uh, that came about, so in 2010, we went and used the um, alert, the schooner, as our platform. Um, i got to get my slides going here again. Um, and PBS and Carl Safina, who was the narrator there, um, got interested and they called us to 
um, come out and film. And you can see Brian and Roger there. So we hosted them. And we didn't catch very much. We sent about 2,000 hooks. Uh, we baited it with all the classic bait you would use. Um, Roger put a lot of effort into this and is a professional commercial fisherman from Portland who ran five uh, ground fishing vessels over his career and is retired now. And we caught one 39-inch halibut, and that's it. And a couple very small um, haddock, cunners, things like that. So there was not very much at the bottom of the bank. Uh, Brian Tarbox and I then got a small grant from the Davis uh, Conservation uh, Fund and we went back to the Proctor sites, which was really what we were interested in. So Proctor had documented the biodiversity. What you see here is a great project that's been shepherded by Jane and the Frenchman's Bay Partners and assisted by the College of the Atlantic. And what this is, obviously, is a map of Frenchman's Bay. And you can see here in the, in the Aqua Square, one of the classic sites that Proctor had dredged in 1926, and the modern taxonomy of what exists there. We went back in 2011, Brian Tarbox and I, with two students. We ran a remotely operated submersible camera system at the bottom of the bay to see what we could find. We also dredged sample and are working through the taxonomy of what we found to try and compare what was on the bottom in 1926 and what there was in 2013. The key thing here is we know that the ground fish are essentially gone in the bay. And we know as apex predators in the bay, they will have an effect down through the food chain on what's happened to the biodiversity of the bay. That's what we're trying to document. So what you see here is what the bottom of the bay looks like. Now remember, PBS had 10 guys with us doing high definition video. This is from our ROV over the summer. And what you'll see here is what the bottom and bald rock looks like. The H here is the heading of the ROV. Uh, our students um, that are funded by the National Science Foundation are actually driving this little ROV. It's about this big, it's tethered to the vessel. And you can see here there's hermit crabs, regular rock crabs. There are uh, burrowing sea anemones, if you watch this video. And the students have gone over a beer bottle um, off the side of uh, Bald Rock, but not a ton of biodiversity at the bottom. Okay? Um, Let me set this over here. You guys need a table right over here with a drink spot. Uh, let me go back. So here's another site. This is a classic site. Turtle Island is an interesting spot. It's an outer bay, so you have a lot more mixing of the uh, cold water. It's just off of Gouldsboro. You, what you'll see in the video here, this is the list of what Proctor found in the 20s, dredging at this site. And uh, this video, we start in the shallower water where it's ledgy, and then we drop off to about 100 feet. Yeah. This white material here is, is an encrusting invasive species. We've actually sequenced the, uh, the DNA to identify what it was with students from Southern Maine Community College just this January. You can see regular horse mussels, modiolus. You don't see a lot of fish. With many hours of video taken over the course of the week, we spent quite quite some time out of the water, and we essentially don't see ground fish. We know they're out there. Um, anecdotally, I've heard that there are fishermen fishing in the pathway of the cruise ships, putting out long lines and catching halibut. So there are fish out there. Interestingly, what you'll see is this um, reasonable, diverse, uh, rocky bottom. And in a minute, it's going to drop into over 100 feet of water. And we see a sort of a monoculture of a single species, the common sand dollar. There it is. So the ROVs now drop down. And surprisingly, Proctor, when he dredged the site, didn't report in any, uh, he didn't even report the species being there. So it's a dynamic ecosystem. What's all the white stuff floating around there? You know, the, the, the waters are really productive. There's a lot of plankton. There are, there are shrimp we've identified. Um, so I can't identify what's in there. But in, in some of the close-up video, and the students analyzed every second of this video in excruciating detail this past summer, um, there's a lot of stuff living in the water column. But the resolution of the camera just won't allow us to do um, identifications of what it is. Okay, 
So where we are in the project now is looking at what I'll call comparative data. And the reason I put this in italics is because, remember, we now have a remotely operated vest vehicle that's, that's running video on the bottom and we're dredging. The records for what Proctor did in the 20s and how he dredged and you know, how long he dredged, how long did he drag the bottom, don't exist. We have some notes about what he was up to. We also, he kept records of abundance relative to common, dense, rare, um, but we don't have good technical data about what it is. We also have the capability that we've been using at the BioLab of taking specimens that we can't identify because no one's an expert taxonomist in all these different um, marine um, life forms. We actually now grind them up and sequence little pieces of their genes to figure out what species we have. So we have a lot of tools at our disposal that Proctor didn't have. So it is comparative data, and I just want to give you just a, a small window of what it is. I'm not sure everybody can see this, but what I'm trying to show here is these are Proctor's lists of the species found, for example, at Bald Rock. So that first video I showed where there wasn't a lot of diversity. This is what we found at Bald Rock in 2013. And I've highlighted a couple colors. That uh, refer back to my second slide. So Proctor, you know, found barn door skates, the very large uh, beaked skate in that picture on the bottom of the door of the tug bunker. Proctor found cod. Proctor found a uh, winter skate. We're not finding these larger fish species in the bay. I don't think he dredged these animals. It's not clear how he got them. I suspect he was fishing at the same time he was dredging. Um, so, and we're finding just a different group of species in the bay. We haven't gotten um, very far in the comparative aspect. And this blank area is the part that Jane was working on today with her AmeriCorps volunteer, trying to look at from 1930 through to the 60s, where the BioLab has records of what was collected. We have this site. Um, and so that's sort of our status report. I will say that it's a dynamic ecosystem. It's changing rapidly. And I'm going to pass the torch to Jane. <laughs> I think that's what I'm So um, I'm going to bring you forward to uh, observations that uh, I've been making with students and community volunteers. Some of you have uh, worked with me over time. Um, and I started really with water quality monitoring, and the one thing that I can tell you is that Frenchman Bay has always had exemplary water quality, and it still does today. So despite many changes in the animals and um, the, you know, the little invertebrates, the benthic guys, and, and the larger uh, ground fish and other fish species in the bay, we still have this, this crystal clear water, you know it. You can go down even at high tide, on the town pier and you can look down and you can see starfish. And so that's where I'm trying to get some transparency readings and I can't because my psyche disk gets spot. <laughs> I can't even uh, take it down far enough. So we have this beautiful bay and I think that's part of where our complacency comes in is that it's just so beautiful to look at and so beautiful to be on. But there are changes underneath and this was a pretty cool picture I was able to get. Um, from over in Barry Cove, um, where you can see that uh, there's not a lot going on down there. There's not a lot of mussels, and there seem to be a lot of dead uh, clam shells. So, um, so there are there are some things changing in the bay. If you go to the Department of Marine Resources and ask them to sort data for you for just the towns in the Frenchman Bay area, you'll find out that um, there's really only four commercial species that are being um, harvested at any um, scale that's, that's really economically significant. And of course, lobsters uh, top the list. Um, and, and next is blue mussels. Soft shell clams come under the mussels at this point in time, and blood worms uh, continue to be up there, but um, almost everything else you get in data from the state says other. So everything else gets lumped into the other category. Um, this is $10 million or so in uh, commercial uh, resources from the Bay, so this, is, this has significant impact on the economy of the whole country area. Um, 
But it isn't as diverse as it used to be based on all those historical practices. So, um, you know, the question is, can we sustain these four fisheries? They seem pretty important. We'd like to, we'd like to think that at least those are going to be around over time. Um, mussels look pretty abundant um, from certain vantage points around the bay, although I challenge you to find a mussel set that looks quite like that these days. I can't tell you how many phone calls I get at the lab saying, I don't have any mussels in front of my house anymore. Where are they? I don't know if you remember the days, but I remember the days walking out on the bar, and the whole bar was blue. You remember blue bar? Because it was amazing. Although people will tell me, well, it comes, it goes. I, I haven't seen it come back. <laughs> um, so there's areas where you think, there's kind of a lot of muscles there. I don't know, maybe they're on their way in, maybe they're on their way out, maybe this was harvested recently. Um, they don't look as abundant here as they did at the other cove I just showed you. But the data, the landings data, tells us that um, there are still significant numbers of mussels out there because the harvest is pretty impressive. What we're, we're seemingly able to get out of this bay year after year. After year. It's, a, it is a, it's number two. It's a very big piece of this local economy. And I can tell you that um, I'm happy because that's me. That's the same sweater. <laughs> Although I'm wearing a skirt, in boots, doesn't that look great? <laughs> but because I can always go out and get muscles for them. I mean, who can't? I mean, you can always go get them. And um, I think that this, that going out and collecting recreationally, collecting muscles, collecting clams, uh, supplements some local diets. You know that that helps people get by when there isn't a lot of money for groceries. So um, things seem to be okay. Um, but we have to be aware that um, that we do have shifting baselines. That what we had isn't necessarily what we have. And although there's some historical data on some species. We're lacking in a lot of information about others. And so um, I think that it's really important that we keep monitoring and we keep looking at what is going on in the day and we kind of keep a tabs on where we're at. I couldn't tell you any more about where the muscle population is at right now than I think anybody else could tell you. All I can tell you is how much we take out. I can't tell you how many are left. Because that's not the kind of data that we're collecting. So shifting baselines, this concept of shifting baselines, was really developed um, in the fisheries arena. This concept came out of uh, people studying fisheries. And it's really defined as a change in how a system is measured against previous reference points. <coughs> so our baseline now for COD is there are no. You know, so any more than nothing would be great. <laughs> you know, right? um, but you know, when do we get to a point where we're happy, like I am, collecting my muscles, with what we have out there? Uh, maybe artisanal fisheries is where we want to head. Are we ever going to get back to like a, a commercial fishery for some of these species? Maybe not. But if we wanted to get there, it would take some planning and some thinking about that. And so this is work that needs to be done. There is a loss of perception of change that occurs when each generation redefines what is natural. And this is where I think that Charlie's work has been really important. Um, you know, he has a lot of other job descriptions at the MBI. <laughs> and um, I actually have some other ones too. <laughs> and, uh, but, and, you know, Chris Peterson at the College of the Atlantic, I mean, he's got a job to teach students, but, you know, there he is out collecting this kind of information uh, with Charlie, with students. Uh, he's on the Marine Resources Committee in Bar Harbor. He's monitoring clams, monitoring clams, monitoring clams. You know, that's above and beyond the call of duty for any human being. But if there's there's some of us out there who are trying to understand, you know, what what goes on over time, what's natural, 
what's not, and how do we keep things where we want them to be. I, I, uh, I got on a TED talk the other night, just looking around for more stuff about shipping baselines, and found these great quotes by this guy, Daniel Pauly, I never knew who he was, but was speaking from the Galapagos, and had pictures, just like Charlie, of these big fish. I guess I didn't even realize Darwin went there to study fish, not fishes. <laughs> but he had a lot of information about fish that tells us today the Galapagos have changed, just like the fish has changed. We transform the world, but we don't remember it, was a quote I pulled out in this <coughs> talk. I recommend you to go and see it. We adjust the baseline to a new level and don't remember what was there. And I think that's what we're trying to do on French Bay is remember what was there. So, I made my 11-year-old daughter go talk with Skippy Dutton, who some of you may know, who had been fishing for lobster on French Bay and other for 50 years. And I made her do this oral history project, which ruined her completely. <laughs> so now she's an art student at Bennington College. <laughs> she wants to be a printmaker. But she never wants to work in GIS ever again the rest of her life. <laughs> but she uh, worked with Zach Steele, a COA graduate, by the way, who came and did an AmeriCorps uh, uh, position with me, just like Anna Farrell here. I've had a dozen of these great AmeriCorps um, young people that have come and help with this kind of work. And um, <coughs> Skippy told her that circa 1950, we had six herring weirs along the Bar Harbor coastline. And his focus was very this side of the bay. All right, this is what he knew. This was the world that he knew. He was the only lobsterman setting lobster traps around 1950. And he put 30 of them out. <laughs> he thought that was a lot, and today he still thinks that's not a um, And so he talked about eelgrass in the Jordan River, around Thomas Bay, around Thomas Island, and Highland Point. <coughs> he said, well, you know, there's a case of whale sightings. Who, who has seen a whale in front of the bay? Yes, some people have seen a whale in front of the bay. <laughs> wow. And they may have been coming in, um, you know, following the herring up the bay. I don't, I don't know. You'll have to tell me more, Steve. <laughs> why occasionally we'll get a whale up here. Not something Skippy feels like we see these days. So in 2005, when she was much younger, my daughter did this interview, and uh, these symbols um, are sized to represent the number of traps that he thinks are out there now, which is you know hundreds and hundreds compared to the thirty. The eel grass was gone from Happy Point by 2005. It was gone around Thomas Island. It was gone. Um, it was still there in the uh, Jordan River, um, but uh, still some around Israel Point. I think it was Israel Point up there. Mussel aquaculture had arrived in the bay. He was talking about mussel rafts. Um, and so I think this kind of work is really important. I know there's some students at COA who've been doing some of this work, but I think we need to capture this history to the uh, best of our ability so that we have not a shifting baseline, but a real baseline to base our decision making around. So Thomas Island in 2005, you get an astronomical low tide, and for sure you're not seeing any of that yellow grass between Thomas Island and the As a matter of fact, you're not seeing much of anything. I won't comment further on that. <laughs> So, um, I want to talk about uh, recent landings data for lobster because lobster are clearly dominating the sea now. And one thing you'll notice that's interesting is, you know, we just seem to be able to catch more of them every year. So, so we just found out of the French Bay area. But if you look at the value, you got to catch more of them to make the same amount of money. At least between 2011 and 2012. I don't have the 2013 data yet, but 2012 was a rough year, as you guys know. And I don't really know how 2013 was. But, but there's a lot of, 
there's a lot of pressure to kind of sustain ourselves at the same place where we were, at least economically. You know, in, in 2011, I put a couple of bidding <coughs> interns on a boat with Phil Corson. <laughs> and I was kind of curious because the work I do is around eelgrass. A lot of you probably know that. I was sort of curious as to what he was catching in and around these eelgrass areas. And he told me he could catch a lot of lobsters near eelgrass beds, but he also told me that he could catch some fish, that he was catching more fish these days. And uh, I had been working with colleagues and community members to restore eelgrass since 2007, and so by 2011 it was like a good sign to me that um, maybe some fish were returning to some of these eelgrass areas. So these spots on here represent GPS coordinates, or students took a coordinate everywhere he pulled up a trap. And these were just three trapping days over, uh, you know, three days he pulled traps over um, <coughs> weeks. And the interesting thing was he had 2,183 lobsters, pretty impressive. 1,178 of those lobsters he was able to keep and I was hoping to see some of these fish he's been talking about, but of 787 whoa, whoa. organisms that were pulled up with the lobsters, 712 of them were green crabs. And I thought nothing of it. And, but it was a warning sign that I didn't pay any bit of attention to. I actually just went back and figured that out like yesterday. <laughs> so 40% of what he was hauling up in his traps were green crabs, an invasive green crab that came here from Europe 100 years ago, but it's on the roof. And it's, and it's influencing even our shifting basins. So um, it wasn't just here that people were beginning to pick up on this green crab issue. It was around the state of Maine, and so the Department of Marine Resources actually did a big call out to everyone saying, we're going to do a statewide survey from one end of the state to the other, and if you guys can get your hands on some lobster traps, let's put them out <coughs> for a day and see what we catch. And so, of course, at the Bio Lab and uh, Chris Peterson from the Marine Resources Committee, um, we, we went out and uh, set lobster traps for 24 hours, and we caught us a few crabs. <laughs> we, were, we were near historic eelgrass areas, just as Phil Corson was in 2011. So we were near shore with these traps. We were not in Hall's Cove. We were not out by Bar Island. We were up by Berry Cove and Hadley Point. But we caught an amazing number of crabs. And we weren't catching any lobsters. So in a 24-hour crab survey in Upper French Bay, Hadley Point East, Hadley Point West, further west, over Mary Cove, the southern part of the cove, the northern part of the cove, there were an average of 57 crabs in each baited lobster trap after 24 hours. I can tell you that we had eight short lobsters in 10 traps and 23 rock crabs, which is encouraging. There's a few rock crabs left out there. <coughs> but, um, but we have this invasive species now that's kind of coming in, and even as we're trying to sustain what we have, we're being challenged by these other forces. So some of you know, but now is my time to make the pitch, that um, there are organizations, institutions, schools, individuals, people from all over Frenchman Bay, we have eight municipalities signed on as partners, in what we're calling Frenchman Bay Partners, and we have developed a vision for this bay. The vision is a healthy and sustainable future. I'm going to talk to you more about what does that mean for future for Frenchman Bay, where multiple users can enjoy the entire beauty and benefit from the ecological and economic viability of the bay. So we recognize we need to put these things in balance, but there's a challenge in that, and I'm glad we're all talking tonight about how we address that challenge. So usually I end my talks with a sunset because that's inappropriate, but this is a sunrise. And it's a sunrise over Goldsboro and Stave Island. 
And so to me, um, I want to end on a helpful note that as French and Bay partners, and you can be involved too, there's some brochures floating around here and how to get involved. But we have identified some of these issues and we're trying to get them on. We're restoring the others. We're trying to open pillars. We're keeping an eye on water quality. We're trying to resolve conflicts among users. So even as little as there is left, we're still fighting over the body. And um, I think that if we put our minds to all of the challenges facing us, that, that French and Bay can be sustainable, but I think together we have to define what, what do we need? What is it that we really want from this bay? And maybe she can help us out. Thank you. We've got time, as always, for <laughs> questions. Um, <laughs> and there's one in the back. Yes. Hi. Is there? Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> you go first. Okay. Uh, is there no uh, food value or commercial value or economic value to green crab? So, uh, oh, she, oh. <laughs> I just went downstairs and talked to Brian yeah. to ask if he would be willing to try and come up with some recipes and a green crab, and he is in. He's in. Wait, <laughs> wait. <laughs> this is a setup. So, this is not a setup. So, uh, that question came up recently to Jane and I, and you've got to remember that we don't really want to be farming green crab. We'd, they're invasive. We'd rather not have them. The better solution might be to have a bounty to go get them out of the system. Like and then doing. eat them. And eat them, yes. <laughs> but not make them a staple and an economic thing that we want to repeatedly, repeatedly fish. Yes. And there are Canadians and there's a company that that's trying Canadians. to start, that's trying to generate uh, a way to get the meat and then put it oh, into really? fish, fish food. There is a, a venture that's out there. I can't remember if it's oh, down east true. or in Canada. I think it could be an interesting outreach project, but yeah. Anyways. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for asking. The answer is no. <laughs> I'm glad to know that there are. <laughs> 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 there are. <laughs> Yes. It's gone up some. 
but in proportion to the number of traps out there, is it lobsters? I mean, oh. in fact, when Skippy had 30 traps. Right. I don't know what the effort is. Yeah. I don't know oh. what the effort is. <laughs> so I, I sort of like trivia, or you, can you tell from my slides? Yes. <laughs> I looked in the data once in the archives in Augusta, and the trap, the yield per trap, at least historically, was highest in 1875, and they were catching immense numbers of lobsters in, in very few traps. So if you looked at just pounds per trap, the records from the 1870s in the archives in Augusta, they were catching an immense number. Now, they, uh, there's lots of data, good peer-reviewed science that, that's sort of indicating that lobsters are being farmed. And people have done uh, light-stable isotope analysis of the bait, and then what's in the lobster's tissue. So they can track, um, you know, feed to the animal because it's sort of a controversial issue. Are you putting so much bait into the system that you're actually ranching? It's not really farming; it would be ranching. And <laughs> <laughs> um, and the, there, there's good data out there that shows that that there's there's a lot of bait put into the system, so it is a ranching operation, which has affected that uh, trap per that catch per yield of trap. Yeah. yeah. But one of the unintended consequences might be who else is feeding on that bait. Yeah. In the back. Are there any examples of similar bays that have recovered? I would say that almost everywhere else in the world, their problem is water quality. Um, I recommend, I don't know the exact answer to that, but there's a, there's a, um, scientist Jeremy Jackson, who had came down to Mary Marine Re Environmental Research Institute it's, uh, a couple years ago, he gives a talk similar to this about shifting baselines. There are some examples where fisheries have come back, and I can't give you which ones they are. They're around the world, and I think the effort on marine protected zones has helped out. I have also to, improving water quality. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm going to step out. I have to say, like Jane's daughter. My daughter's giving her first scientific talk tonight in 10 it minutes. It might be her last uh, one, so go see it. I have to go to high school. She's talking about larval fish surveys. Yeah. All right. Well, I get to go. Yeah. All right. Although my daughter paints fishes. Sir, have you tried in any way to relate the overfishing of the Grand Banks? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a big challenge in that we have no control here locally over what's going on out in the greater Gulf of Maine. And so we probably locally had little to do with, and there's not a lot we can do about, herring runs disappearing in the Frenchman Bay. Um, I, you know, I can't speak a lot to to the relationship there. I'm, That's a great reading from the yeah. 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 If there has been, I'm not on top of that. But um, anybody else here know anything about the relationship between overfishing out in the greater Gulf and the impact on the smaller bay? Frenchman Bay 
uh, hopeful that we might see some um, some return at, at some level of these populations here. And we were hearing the same thing in 2011 when we sent interns out on a lobster boat to look at bycatch because we heard the lobstermen were also getting these fish in their traps. We weren't successful in seeing anything but a, like three or four skull fins in the 400 or so hulls that we, we were out there for. But, and you know, uh, Phil was disappointed in five or six lobsters per trap and actually moved um, out of Frenchman Bay and went off of uh, Sand Beach to finish out his season. So we had actually ended our interview. <coughs> Um, study prematurely so um, the, the lobstermen are you know they're moving and that's another thing to consider uh, in, in terms of how you collect data it's not just how much you're getting and the size but also where are you which is hard to get at sometimes from fishermen you know where are these <laughs> but that's, yeah. that's part of the shifting baseline too is how much further offshore or how in the Gulf do people yeah. need to go to sustain the same level of um, landings or livelihood that they had before. So I don't have those coordinates. Yeah. 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 Question. Um, yeah, looking at that side of the question, um, these are difficult times for fishing. Yeah. Uh, many species have disappeared, others have declined. Uh, what is happening with the fishing families? Uh, many main families have been fishing <coughs> generation after generation. What message is it going to you know, I feel like Penobscot East and uh, Resource Center is doing a lot of work around fishing families, and I feel like someone else can help me here. Like, I, I hear that you're all Stonington and um, Sumner High School. There's a bunch of high schools that are interested in, in marine programs for their young people, and, and they're really trying to help young people see different aspects of uh, being involved in a marine livelihood, whether it be like alternate ways to use product or, um, or getting involved at the dealer level or just different ways to be involved in the industry besides fishing themselves. Um, but I, you know, I haven't tracked those programs really closely and what are the aspirations for these young people. Um, someone has to help me. Does MDI High School actually have one of these marine skippers programs that that Penobscot East is is trying to get established around the state? I'm not sure if MDI High School does, but you know, East will help young people if they want to get involved. So you have a lot to go. If yeah. You want to try to help out there's some stuff like that, but yeah. uh, it's really not. Scallops are starting to rebound a little bit. Um, I talked to an old fisherman. He said they used to scallop a lot, but they're not down by the shore path. Stuff oh, like that. Yeah. Yeah. So that was one of the species that you know, we get down there. So, yeah. Um, but there's very, you know, obviously a presentation. There's very little biodiversity out there. Yeah. Clams are yeah. disappearing. Yeah. You know, it's really, unless you're lost there, there's no aspiration. Uh, hey, how are you? Yeah, so what we're hearing over here is that, you know, among young people, there's yeah. very low aspiration because there's less and less that they can than they that they can go for. You know, the scallop harvesting, the shrimp harvesting, it's all um, you know, it's it's year to year, what's the opportunity locally? If you have to go far, the cost of the fuel is it worth what you're going for. Yeah. If I might ask another question, but you in the some of Charles slides talking about the uh, the way that fishing was done, the methodology, uh, how it was done in the 200s and before. Lobster fishing in particular, with the exception of using a motorized boat and winch, the methodology has not changed dramatically over a number of generations. But ground fish fishing and the associated damage that modern ground fish fishing has done to the fisheries here as in, off the Grand Banks and many other places uh, is dramatically different than uh, fishing a tub of long lines by hand. Yeah. Does anybody ever 
come forward and say, oh yeah, it's a, it's about how we're doing it or how we've done it. Yeah, it's and I don't about mean more in favor of fishermen. I, you know, I don't mean yeah. that, but I, there's certainly a methodology has changed so dramatically. The yeah. effect that it's had on the environment, on other species of plants and mussels, everything else, Ugrass. dragging chain right. pencil on the bottom as opposed to doing it with hand line is considerably so different. So certainly that group out of University of New Hampshire that did a con study, if you, hit, if you hear Karen Alexander talk or Bill Leavenworth in it, you know, they're talking all about the history of gear changes and how we got more effective and efficient at harvesting these animals and how we were taking them in mass and you know whole breeding populations of uh, fish and associated and, damage to other species. Yeah, yeah, so that needs to maybe be part of the conversation is do we need to step back and think about going to ways that are less efficient but actually give us that ecological and economic balance in our ecosystem. Um, you know, we have a number of mussel harvesters in the Frenchman Bay area who have been working closely with the partners on, um, on this issue because mussel harvesting can be very damaging in the ecosystem and certainly I think it was responsible for a lot of early eelgrass loss in Frenchman Bay. Uh, Ralph Smith in particular, he owns Moosebeck Mussels in Jonesport. He's been very uh, active in participating with our group um, he has pulled all the harvesters together on this bay to talk about where they might drag and where not. That is unprecedented in the Gulf of Maine where voluntarily these guys are doing area management and um, choosing not to drag in places where they think there might be a chance to bring back some of these okay. areas. So I'm yeah, impressed with some of that effort. But Ralph Smith has also invented a drag that he uses and has his drag up on um, a sled and he feels that he does a lot less damage than some of his cohorts. And one of the conversations I'd like to get going around the bay is how do we help that guy patent his design? <laughs> and, get, and maybe Golf and Maine Research Institute, since they work a lot on gear design these days, are, you know, they would be the right partner to pull in to talk about how do we get a different kind of a drag going. You know, in terms of, fa you know, I know personally mussel harvesting families who were affected, especially when there was a closure in Taunton Bay, first when there was, um, when there was the bridge was replaced and, and, and there was one family in particular that used to be able to get under the bridge and they couldn't get under the new bridge and their fishing area was kind of cut off from them and then there were some closures in Taunton Bay. So, um, you know, I know families that have gone to nothing, couldn't fill their fuel tanks at home, their kids didn't have clean clothes to wear, the families broke up, you know. There are some sad stories about people trying to try keep life going with muscle harvesting and, um, I, you know, I'd like to find a way to try to keep some of these people some of these people's livelihoods going without the disruption and destruction in the bay that there is, but that's gonna, they're going to need help with doing that. Because if it's all they know and it's all they have, it's what their families are, are living on. You know, when you know case by case and story by story and family by family, it's harder to stand up here and say, we should get rid of dragging. You know, and that's where I used to be, some of you who know me from way back when. You know, I was a pretty ardent, like, out there kind of... <laughs> You know, can't we just stop all this and make it all pretty again? But it's not that simple for people. So I think we do need to have the complicated conversation, and I think we need to help each other get to where we need to be. And gear change is expensive and difficult, and it's part of the conversation. Thank you. Last question. Sorry. Put on and on. are not on the pH thing uh, just yet, and part of that is because pH is actually really complicated to measure, and um, it's not as simple as sticking a pH probe in the water, and uh, I don't know that we have anybody geared up to do pH appropriately in the Bay right now, um, but there are people talking about getting it started, in particular around the clam flats and acidic floods and that. But, um, 
But water temperature, it's interesting because we have a, a NOAA logger at the town pier, but that doesn't seem to be giving me good information about what's going on in the rest of the upper bay. So it was just last summer that we started deploying temperature loggers around the bay. And, um, and so we're trying to compare that data to what we have at the town pier. But again, I don't have super good baseline on the future. I can tell you that just based on the data we have from the town pier, that 2011 was actually warmer than 2012 when the 12th of May got really warm, which is why we think some of these crabs exploded. And hopefully this cold winter has not been back yet. But, um, but 2013 is down, 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 and it, and, it, and it was from the start, from the get-go, not just with the cold winter, but 2013 was way below 2011 and 2012. So, you know, we come and go. It's not like it's a constant increase, 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 increase. And it's interesting to me that although the whole Gulf of Maine was warmer in 2012, Frenchman Bay, at least in the town here, was actually warmer in 2011 than it was in 2012. So I think local data is really important for getting a handle on what's going on in our own backyard. I don't think that, you know, Gulf of Maine-wide data or buoy data from offshore is helping to guide us that much in our upper bay. Thank you very much. All right, thank you guys.